Once again, it's good to see everyone. Appreciate your uh, coming out and being with us tonight. Of course, this is, uh, has already been mentioned, family Bible time, and so we'll try to uh, abbreviate our lesson just somewhat. You know, I don't know about you, but I have never really liked being in debt. That doesn't mean that I have not been in debt. I suppose we all have. And, and maybe the main reason I don't like being in debt is because I hate the idea of paying the interest to somebody to use their money. And secondly, I don't like the idea of that indebtedness hanging over my head and you wonder, well, what happens if something happens and I, I can't pay it? But the sad fact is our nation's economy centers around indebtedness, doesn't it? And, and frankly, I don't know too many people who can go out and buy a house and just shell out the cash. For that matter, not too many people can go out and buy a new automobile and pay cash. And so we have mortgages and we have automobile loans and some of the automobile loans now are about like a mortgage. I know some of these new vehicles cost as much as a house did not too many years ago. But this evening I want to talk about indebtedness from a slightly different angle, a little different approach. I'm not talking about financial indebtedness. I'm not talking about signing a mortgage to buy a house. But yet this indebtedness that I want to mention is something that's just as great. Is something just as important as that debt we have for our vehicle, for our house, or for our children's college education. And, and certainly we don't have time to consider every aspect of this indebtedness that I want to bring up. But first and foremost, I would suggest that every one of us owe a tremendous debt to God. And again, we could spend our entire time this evening talking about this one point. But take just a moment and stop and think about all the things that we owe God for. For example, he created this wonderful world in which we live, this perfect world. I realize it's not perfect now because man has messed it up, but as God created the world back in the book of Genesis, as we come to the close of the creation week, we find that God looked around and he saw everything the King James says was good, but quite literally there the Hebrew says he saw everything that it was very good. It was perfect. There was no imperfection in that creation that God made. And, and of course, the text that James read for us from Acts chapter 17, 23 and 24, you may recognize this as being part of Paul's sermon there at Mars Hill. He's speaking to a, a, a group of idolaters, people who worshipped all sorts of gods. And in fact, they had gods for every day of the week. And Paul tells them this. He says, I walked through your city and I saw all of these gods and even a god or excuse me, an altar for the unknown God in case they'd missed one. And so he begins to preach to them about the true and living God. And one of the things that he affirms to them there in verse 24, that he made the world and all things therein. And so we should appreciate all that God has done for us. Who could go out early in the morning, and I know some of you probably don't like going out this early, but who can go out early in the morning and watch the sunrise and not be struck with the power of God, the beauty of His majesty. Or go out in the evening, and, and this is something you don't get to do much in the city, but when we go to Michael's, you can't see any lights from their house because the neighbors are not close enough. So you walk out in their driveway and you look up and the stars are so bright and so beautiful and you can't help but be impressed with a God that's powerful enough to place all those stars up there. I'm reminded of David's words in Psalm 19 and 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Think about the beauty of Niagara Falls, the great smoky mountains, the Grand Canyon and the other beauties of nature that, that are there. And yet some people say, oh well, this is just coincidence, just evolution caused these things to evolve. No, all of these things evidence the hand of a creator of a mighty power that placed them there. But not only has God given us this beautiful world in which we live, He's given us our physical life. You ever thought about that? We are alive because God gave us the breath of life. Again, from Acts chapter 17, the same sermon that Paul preached, in verse 25, speaking of God, he said, Neither is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything. And then he goes on to say, Seeing He giveth life and breath, and all things. We exist because of God. Every living thing is here because of God and we owe a debt for that. But even more importantly than our physical life in this beautiful world that we've been given, God gave us the greatest gift and that's the gift of His Son. 
John 3.16 is a verse that most everyone can quote. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. But if you ever really stop to think about what that verse means, we often read it in the abstract. Yeah, God gave his son for the world. But God gave his son for me, for my sins, for my redemption. Just as he gave his son for you, for your sins, and, and for your redemption. Another passage from Paul, the pen of Paul in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And let's face it, without this gift, without this gift of God's Son, we would be hopelessly and helplessly lost without any hope of being redeemed. And Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 12. But not only that, God has given us our families. I suppose one of the greatest material blessings, and I don't know any other way to describe it than to say material blessings, but one of the greatest worldly or earthly blessings that we have are our families. Our parents, our children, our grandchildren, our siblings. As we look back in Genesis 2 and verse 18, we find that God made Eve to be a helpmeet, to be a companion for Adam. And, and God has created husbands and wives to support one another, to love one another, to nourish one another, not only from a physical standpoint, but spiritually to be helpmeets. He's given us families to comfort us in times of sorrow and times of trial. And, and yes, sometimes family members may betray us. But as a rule, we're close to our families, aren't we? We love our families. Friends are great to have, but they can't begin to compare to the love of family. Think how lonesome our lives would be, how sad this world would be if it weren't for family, for parents and children. But not only that, we must never forget that God has given us all spiritual blessings. And I guess that sums it up other than the material blessings. Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And if we begin to enumerate, to mention all of the spiritual blessings that God has given us, we'd use all of our time just on this one point. But suffice it to say, God has given us all spiritual blessings, blessings such as prayer, being able to address God as our Father, being able to have fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, those who are also in the family of God with us. The blessing of having Jesus as our older brother. The blessing of knowing that God will be with us no matter what happens. Knowing that God will work things to our benefit, as Romans 8 and verse 28 tells us. And the blessing of knowing where we came from and where we are going. And yes, we can know if we've obeyed the gospel or if we've not obeyed the gospel, if we've been faithful or if we have not been faithful. And so in summary, God has given us everything that is good, everything that is desirable. In contrast with that, what has Satan ever done for us? Nothing. I challenge you to name one thing the devil has done good for mankind. And this is why the scriptures warn us to be sober and to be vigilant or watchful because Satan is out to destroy us, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. And with all of this being said, the truth of the matter is we could never repay God in a million years. You know, you can obey the gospel. Let's say you're 13, 14 years old. You obey the gospel and, and you live faithfully the rest of your life and you live to be 100. There's no way to repay that debt that we owe our Heavenly Father. And aren't you glad that God doesn't say, okay, here's what I've done for you. Here's how much you owe me. Here's what you've got to do to repay me for what I've done for you. No. It was the free gift of God, as Scripture calls it. It was a gift of love. It was a gift of mercy, a gift of compassion, a gift of grace. And God doesn't sit up there and say, okay, you owe me this much more. You've got to do this much more. He said, no. It's a gift. No strings attached other than to love him and to serve him faithfully for the rest of our life. We could talk about in a similar vein the debt that we owe Jesus Christ. And I, and I realize that it pretty well overlaps with the debt that we owe God. But, but nonetheless, we owe a tremendous debt to God. And, and one other before we close, we owe a tremendous debt 
to our parents. There's no way to put a value on godly Christian parents. And I suppose sometimes those of us who were brought up by Christian parents take it for granted. Perhaps sometimes we fail to appreciate what we were blessed with in comparison to those who were brought up in worldly families or, or ungodly families. Think of those who were brought up in irreligious homes. I hear people talk about growing up in homes where alcohol was a problem, where drugs were a problem, where abuse was rampant. I was talking to someone yesterday, and in and, and this family, the children were severely abused, and no one knew it. And this was back in the 60s, and, and the girl said, I tried to tell them at school the things that were being done to us, and they called my mother. And she abused us even more. And I couldn't help but think how fortunate I was to grow up in a, a Christian family who wouldn't do things like that. The greatest gift that a child can have is a godly Christian mother and father. You know, parents, we want to give the best to our children. We want to provide everything that maybe we didn't have as, as young people growing up. But, but again, let me reaffirm the greatest gift that we can give our children, the greatest gift that we can give our grandchildren is not a car, it's not a legacy, it's not a college education paid for. It's a godly Christian family. A mother and a father who love one another, who love God, who love their children. And when that exists, the material things don't really matter. We could talk about other indebtedness that we have to faithful Christians who've gone on before us. We could talk about indebtedness to godly elders of the church. We could talk about our indebtedness to those who faithfully proclaim the gospel. And on and on the list could go. There's so many people that we are indebted to. We need to make sure that we express that appreciation. Let people know that we love them and that we appreciate them. Not only God and prayer, but our families, our parents, if they're still living, our children. We should tell those in the church who have been a godly example for us. And I'm thinking of several in, in this congregation who passed on who were tremendous examples of the Christian life. And many of you, if you thought about it for a minute, you would think of others. But we are indeed so blessed. We have such a debt that we could never repay it. But we're going to close our lesson for this evening by extending the invitation of Christ. What are you doing about the debt you owe? God has done so much for you. What are you doing for him? Are you living for him? Are you serving him? Are you following him in the steps of Christ? Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you have the opportunity to become one. Coming in faith, repenting and turning of your sins confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins and to begin serving him faithfully. Tonight, if you need to respond to this invitation or if you need the prayers of the church, let us help you. Will you come while we stand and we sing? Oh, yeah.